<laughs> All right. I am now recording on this computer. This is the first time that I have been the recorder of a Zoom video since they changed the UI to make that voice happen. Oh, wow. The Orwellian <laughs> warning. Yeah. yeah. Interesting. Hmm. Orwellian warning. Yeah, that's something. Um, evolutionary squeeze is definitely something like many people are that I know that I'm in some kind of relationship with are having their lives, hmm, let's say shaken up, but in ways that ultimately seem like they're in the pr proper direction. Um, yeah, things are really heating up for me uh, all around. Yeah, you want to want to share? I'd love to get a, just a context on, on where. And from my point of view, I'm actually going to be paying attention to it almost like from a higher level of saying, okay, what is that? What are the portents? What are the what are the portents that are implied by this? Um, so I mean, so some of it, uh, I mean, a lot of it had to do with the trip to the UK, right? And, and uh, the Rebel Wisdom events, and then the talk at Cambridge. Um, and uh, talk, I I posted a link to the talk at Cambridge, um, and getting a lot of response from it. Many people saying it's sort of the best single introduction to all of my work, uh -huh. uh, which. Um, um, getting interest in a lot of people uh, in it, and and then there's been just an uptake in interest in uh, both people academically uh, wanting to work with me and uh, and people you know inviting me to come and speak at conferences. Um, just sort of that overall uh, increase, the intensity, and um, correspondingly, there's been a huge uptick in the interest in sort of uh, the practices of work that I'm doing, the ecology of practices, dialectic mm -hmm. into dialogos, the workshop I did with Chris and Guy, and then uh, the demonstration that I did with Johannes in uh, London. And then I did uh, uh, Taylor Barrett's Authentic Relating Toronto. I did a dialectic into dialogos last night. Yes. Um, another one on Sunday. So uh, just all of that has really sort of taken off. Nice. Okay. So, so let me drop this in. Um, I'm just going to drop things in as they come along just so we can kind of get the, the ingredients. Yeah. Uh, and this is definitely operating in a very esoteric channel. So just take it as uh, at, at, the, at that level. We'll, we'll try to figure out how to make it make sense in a, in, yeah, in, yeah. in dialogue. So I think yesterday, maybe in two days ago, a thing happened that I noticed, which was Elon Musk, who's a person like a known person who has yep. a, clearly a role to play in the bigger story, did something that seems odd, which was he challenged Vladimir Putin to personal one-on-one -on -one combat with Ukraine as the prize <laughs> um, on That's Twitter. Very, how very medieval of him. <laughs> on Twitter. Cool. Yeah. Um, and part of it was in Russian, right? So I don't know if he speaks Russian, if he was just translating it using you know some mechanism, obviously hundred cent a billionaire, so he has the capacity to get Russian done for him right. like. Um, and the the guy who's the head of I think Belarus. I don't unfortunately I don't have precision on this name. But the guy has kind of like the intense beard and kind of feels like he's not from this world. Right. Um, replied on Telegram, not in Twitter, but on Telegram, with it responded to Elon Musk, you know, yeah. indicating, hey, you don't want to be you know messing with with Vladimir Putin in one on one combat, but if you want to train, here's some offers of different training regimens that we can offer you to participate. Right, so you've got a an actual head of an actual nation state directly connected with Vladimir Putin, right? Engage in a war, responding to an event on Twitter through a different channel, Telegram. They're both aware of it. Must copy, you know, photocopy or, or snapshot of the, the Telegram, put it and put it on Twitter, right? So just that's happening. It's important to just recognize, okay, that's actually happening. It's, it's a part of the reality we live in. Yes, that's really, yes. really occurring. Right? Yeah, that, yeah. that was not going down in World War II. No, 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 no. Ger Ger Gerbils and, uh, you know, pick your, pick your opposite number. We're not like smack talking each other via you know, virtual <laughs> digital media. Like it's a different vibe. Yes. And so the, my take, my sense of it was, this is actually exactly right. Like there's something going on here happening at a level of like, a, let's call it a higher level of consciousness or a, sort of a subtle cognition that is orienting in the proper direction. All right, so let me drop in one more piece. Hold on one second, just a quick pause.
Yeah, I apologize for grabbing so much time, but there's this, these two pieces I think are exactly right. Schmackenberger put this other one in my head. So again, I guess about two days ago, maybe three, uh, maybe actually exactly the same time, which is itself interesting. A gentleman named Michelle Bowens, who I don't think you know. Do you know Michelle? All right, so yep. Michelle's another, he's in a, in a, a piece of the field that's, that's sort of not connected closely to where you are. His world is uh, the commons and P2P. So right. he's at the center of that universe, really, and has been for quite some time. He's, uh, I think, Belgian in origin, uh, but he's been living in Thailand for quite some time. And he and I have never met personally, but we've known each other now for God, better part of a decade, even more than a decade. Uh, so things like future of economy, future of governance, future of like socio-technical, like that stuff is sort of his valley with. And he posted a very interesting uh, frame on Facebook, not Twitter, uh, which I don't participate in anymore, that Daniel asked me, Daniel like said, hey, would you please read this and give me your feedback? And, and Michelle posted, proposed that a way of looking at what's going on in Ukraine is to properly think of it not as a war between, say, Russia and Ukraine, or even in some sense between Russia and NATO or the West, but actually a conflict between two systems. Mm. And the particular frame that he used is he went back to World War I and World War II to kind of create frames of what the word system might mean and talked about uh, the conflict between, uh, in World War II, he identified three systems. There was the, the communist system, which was a, a top-down state-dominated. Mm -hmm. uh, there was the, the, the capitalist system, which was bottom-up market-dominated. And then there was the fascist system, which was sort of a, a, a hybridization, state-dominated, but also very much more powerfully dominated with oligarchy. Um, which is you know, typically how we would think of fascism. So, and the idea is he said, okay, these were three different systems that were very complex relationships with each other, with no obvious directionality where they would break. It ended up breaking such that capitalism and communism, two odd bedfellows, allied against fascism, and that's how World War II played out. Mm -hmm. He's like, if you look at it through that lens, that's maybe the better lens just to imagine what was happening, or at least a, a useful lens. And then he proposed that the contemporary circumstances can be viewed through a lens, something like that, that there's something about the market bottoms up, decentralized, and by the way, financially driven, right? finance as the primary driver of the West, where governance and um, centralized authority is subsidiary. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the centralized authoritarian top down, which both China and Russia are much naturally exponents of. And that's you know, another turn of that, of that cycle. Right. And maybe the important payload here, the reason why it came to my mind was then proposing a third path, right? which, which they say, hey, we in the, the, the PDP community, the, the commons community have a term called cosmolocalism that we would propose as actually being a third path in this story, which is neither of the other two and may in fact be the proper one for us to be following as a, as a human family. So uh, I don't think we're gonna have time for, to go into it here, but in, in response to that, I, I kind of gave a maybe a 30 minute uh, reframing where I, I think that the, the basic sense is gesturally direct. The topology of the dynamics are I think substantially more fundamental than that. Um, for example, I would say that a primary dividing line is actually at the level of generative grammar, mm. that the, the, literally at the level of like alphabet versus ideogram, like that's the level yeah. of, of psychology and media that creates a depth of difference and a, a foundation uh, upon which evolutionary developmental difference settles that is actually equal to the magnitude of the degree of change that we're actually undergoing. Mm -hmm. um, but in any event, and there's a whole stuff there, of course, we can talk about it if you're interested, but the, the end point was, and this notion of a third, which is founded on an equivalently or actually more equivalently fundamental foundation of thirdness from the other two, um, is actually correct, meaning that, that the proper thing for us to be doing right now is to be discerning this third and then embodying that third increasingly over time. And that actually is the only true viable path to peace and stability. Um, that in some sense, the thing that we might think of as the West and the thing that we might think of as the East and the various sort of variations on that theme in terms of how they sit together aren't stable intrinsic, intrinsically. Yeah. 
Agreed. and therefore, if left to their own devices, will only find conflict uh, and an increasingly escalating conflict, uh, seeking dominance, seeking unity, seeking a, a singleton, like hegemony. But there actually is a, a third path, which is able to achieve simultaneously uh, adequate strength and power on its own basis to establish itself vis-a-vis -vis each of the other two, but more importantly, is what creates the possibility of stability in a larger whole that is not a, a, unity, a unitary hegemon. I'm noticing the back of my mind, the notion of the Trinity uh, yeah. is also, hey, by the way. <laughs> um, and I connect that to the previous narrative around Elon Musk. Okay. Right. So what I would say is something like my, my reading of it, which is mostly, uh, again, almost uh, poetic and aesthetic, but I don't think it's nut. I don't think it's nuts. Is something like, like everyone, Elon is doing his best to make his way through the world using his frameworks and models and experience. But there's shit going on that is just happening that he's perceiving, but doesn't really land within a well-formed paradigm. But he right. can't help but increasingly be governed by that because it's it's like a, an emergent liminal self that is actually whole and part of him that isn't integrated with the part of him that he identifies with as himself, but is increasingly solid and strong and is actually showing up more and more in how his choices are actually playing out. Mm -hmm. And so this eruption into the public sphere, by the way, through the digital yeah, yeah. Uh, of, hey, the proper thing here is, in fact, I'm going to just challenge Vladimir Putin to single combat for Ukraine, I would say is an esoteric expression of the third sphere or speaking through Elon, who's a very proper uh, voice for this, I would say, almost not perfect, but good, of the right thing. The right thing here is actually that Ukraine should be removed as a plaything of conflict between East and West, between Russia and NATO, but actually should be elevated into a completely third polity, which mm -hmm. is a different regime altogether. And then that's actually exactly the right place for it to be. And that if we find our way into discerning what that proper place is, and then finding a way to ground that, which we could do, the energy and capacity for doing that for real, like in the context of geopolitics exists right now, it just requires a, a, an adequate level of consciousness and distributed cognition with a sort of a, a, a bootstrapping co-evolutionary path of development can get us there in like a year at, at wartime paces. And a whole bunch of other stuff starts to fall into place. Right? So looping all the way back, I then use all of that to then contextualize your stream. Right? I would say that a big piece of your stream is actually generating the, uh, the what are they called? The chandelier cell networks inside the distributed cognition that's the embodiment of this third path. So the, the becoming of the neocortical and the chandelier structure that actually helps each and every one that is attracted to and participating in, in some sense at a very high level, but probably actually all the way through, so that the capacity of the third path to actually be increasingly self-aware and self-agentic on a completely different basis than has been part of either West or East or the variations thereof uh, is that piece. Okay, whew, done. <laughs> wow, that was a symphony. <laughs> So first of all, off the top of my head, something that's leaping out is something else that's just happening right now, um, both on YouTube and Twitter. Uh, Jonathan Pajot and I did our second video uh, on the series on angels in scientific terms. And oh, uh, shit, the discussion, the Man, discussion. May, have to, may have to watch that one. That sounds awesome. <laughs> um, and so, um, and uh, I was basically using the work that I did with Dan on the, the rovers, which I gave the talk on mm -hmm. at, at Cambridge about and the distributed cognition and, and the way that it's neither uh, uh, bo just bottom up or top down, but uh, like it's distributed cognition in, in, in its own right. And we, we have to start thinking of this, uh, the agency uh, that uh, yes. solves problems through collective intelligence and um, and whether or not personal models of these uh, hyper agents, hyper objects are actually the best or not. And I was very surprised, although I shouldn't be because of Jonathan's, uh, you know, subtlety of thought. Jonathan, it, it, Jonathan did, some, I keep telling people, Jonathan is more radical than people realize. He somehow went through this deep dive into the church fathers and came out as an ancient, this is what Paul uh, Vanderclay, he, he's a church father. That's who John Jonathan Pajot is. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's very interesting um, position. But when we got to talking about this, he made initial arg arguments about the hyper agents 
that can interact with hyper objects and solve hyper problems, right? Um, and I was saying, you know, uh, the consensus is emerging that these hyper, that they're really agents, they really have intelligence, but they don't have consciousness. And because of that, uh, that consciousness is really delimited in the range in which it can show up, right? And so because of that, thinking of these things as uh, like a sort of personal consciousnesses is probably not accurate. And he actually said, that might be right, John. I'm not sure that the church fathers actually thought of them as having consciousness. Or so he was willing to shift into a more sort of purely Neoplatonic framing of it. And then and then the reaction to this uh, has just been really, you know, there's there's a minor Twitter storm uh, about this discussion. And, and then there's that going on. And then the talk I gave at Cambridge about the, the role of ritual, the imaginal, in affording our interaction uh, with distributed cognition. All of this, all of this is now sort of gelling um, uh, in a really powerful way. Um, so that's just off the top of my head about uh, uh, what you're talking about, and what it, and it brings in it for me. It was proof of concept of the possibility of Neoplatonism <clears throat> being the courtyard of dialogos as opposed to the courtroom of debate. Yeah. Uh, he and I have different positions. But the Neoplatonism allowed us to try and probe and explore revising ontology in order to account for the emerging realization of distributed cognition, hyper agents dealing with hyper objects and solving hyper problems. Yeah. Yes. Yes. This is all. This is all. This is all right. Um, so things. One. I noticed that he announced recently that he and Brett Weinstein had a conversation. Yeah, Brett and I are supposed to have a conversation too. Uh, it's supposed to happen at some point. Yeah, great. Yeah, it's almost like I feel in myself like uh, just for background. Brett and I collaborated very closely. Um, he was part of the early thing that was known as Game B. Right. Uh, we actually met before that. We we collaborated in, in advance of that, and I would say we're, was one of my primary collaborators for quite some time. But we actually haven't spoken. I would say more than thirty minutes. Uh, a quarter in the past couple of years. Oh, wow. And I noticed it's almost like I feel in the back of my mind, like there needs to be a shift in the network. Like, okay, great. Him talking to Paggio, him talking to you, like those network connections actually have to be in place for the shift to occur that enables my connection with him to actually find a, a new location that actually yeah. opens back yeah. up to proper generativity. Yeah, I think that's right. I'm very... Uh, intrigued to see. I, I think Jonathan said they spoke for three hours. So I'm mm. very intrigued to, to to dip into this conversation. That's uh, really nice. Yeah. Took his course, as you say, Jonathan's holding something with, I'll just say impeccability. Like there's a certain degree to which he's holding it like full, fully committed, deeply into it, and also properly in relationship with the allowing it to be what it is and not trying to hold it to be something that he'd prefer it to be. This is the dialogue of the place. Um, Okay, church father. Sounds good, right? Churches need fathers. <laughs> I'm intrigued by what that implies about church mothers um, and where they are in this story. Um, yeah, I mean, and, and I'm meeting more and more of them. Um, so I've been meeting people that I've been meaning to meet for quite a while. Uh, I've had a good, a couple of very good, three now, I think, interactions with Benita Roy, having another oh, one with Oh, fucking hell, of course. Great. With her and Rafe Kelly tomorrow. That'll be our second one. Wow. And, um, and then. Um, Do you guys uh, connect over Qigong? Pardon me? Did you guys connect over Qigong, by the way? Uh, it came up. No, we were actually brought together uh, and by two things. Uh, one was I'm working with Nathan Vanderpool to try and network all the leaders of these emerging community of practices together. Uh -huh. Trying to network them by get, trying to create a lingua franca for us all and also uh, get the leaders talking to each other, connections to be formed. Um, actually trying to build a community of communities. And that's how I met her first. Then we were both invited on to Peter Lindbergh's The Stoa. And uh -huh. we had a great good conversation there. You should and change the name, by the way, from The Stoa to The Yenta. Pardon me? You should change the name from The Stoa to The Yenta. He's beginning to <laughs> just play that role, which I think is actually right. <laughs> um, but he, but he is, he, he's looking more and more like Marcus Aurelius. Uh, so that, <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's how I met, um, that's how uh, a second time. And then the third time is uh, 
we're back again with Nathan, but this time Benita and I were meeting with Rafe uh, to try. And, and that, that's the other thing that's quickening, Jordan. I'm talking to more and more people, uh, you know, um, Scott Jordan about wild systems theory mm. and uh, Rich Blundell about ecological intelligence as an ontological reality uh -huh. um, uh, uh, um, and as a response to the meaning crisis. And then uh, uh, John Stewart um, about, uh, you know, uh, really taking serious uh, what evolution is showing us about how we can best, uh, you know, uh, conform to the unfolding of reality. Like, they're, 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 and they're, again, not only they're disparate communities, they're disparate thinkers. And, and there's, you know, there's, there's a part, I, I've, I've sort of become, I did not apply for the job. I'm not even sure if I want the job, but I'm becoming, I'm becoming a vetting station uh, in some ways. And I guess I, I, um, that is, I mean, I feel, uh, I feel obligated morally to do it. Like I said, it would, it, it, that's not how I would choose to spend my time, but it seems like uh, the role, the role has been, I guess this is the best way to say it. The role has been given to me and I'm increasingly, uh, involved with that too, trying to figure out, uh, to the best of my ability, how to, plug people into this larger distributed cognition that's forming. Right. Uh, um, I hope I'm not like Corellin from Childhood's End, where I usher people into the overmind, but I don't get to participate in it. Uh <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, well, on that point, I would, I, would, I would put out there, I don't know if this is logistically plausible, but maybe it is. I don't, New England distances, I don't really have in my model. Um, if it's logistically plausible, I would recommend trying to find a way to meet Benita in physical person. Yeah. And, and both of you have deep practice in some of the more embodied practices. Yeah. Yes. I'll yes. This right now, like trying to engage with Benita exclusively through the verbal semantic. It's, it's you're not going to be able to get the whole thing. Like you actually need to. I, 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 I get that already. I mean, it, it's already magical between us. Um, but I understand yeah. how, how presencing is a very big thing. Uh, for her and uh, sort of lived connectedness. Yeah, uh, the way you described it, it, it. Yeah, I would like. I want to meet all. I mean, I've never met Rafe in person. I'm hoping to go down in July and do his parkour course and 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 do all, all that stuff. Oh wow! Uh, but there's a lot of places I'm supposed to be going. Um, so yes, it's going to be. It sounds like you're probably going to be doing a lot of, uh, of of movement physically during the summer. That's what's that's what seems to be the case, and um, I'm hoping my partner can come with me for many of those because having her with me um, in the UK trip and Cambridge just moved oh. it up an order of magnitude. Oh yeah, um, yeah. She she's she's amazing, <laughs> um, and her like her capa her capacity for like she has the thing I really admired in Socrates. Socrates has this, has this ability to sort of transform his comportment so that it really matches the interlocutor and uh -huh. draws them out very naturally. She does that perfectly and beautifully. Um, I tend to have to mediate through all kinds of stuff to get <laughs> that with people. <laughs> but she just does that. Um, and and, and uh, so I, I'm hoping that uh, at least for some of them, time will allow her like because she's got all, all of her commitments the time will allow her to uh, come with mm -hmm. me as many of them as possible um I think one of the one of the things that is very important to me and that and we've been talking about it, and there seems to be good good reason to believe this is the case that the relationship is evolving to deal with how i don't know what my term uh, my status or it's not status that's the wrong term my I don't know what to say. My role is, um, as things are changing for me, the relationship is evolving very well uh -huh. uh, to, to, uh, to adapt to that and to afford it. And I'll also allow the way the world and I are now connecting to feed back into the relationship in a valuable way. And I'm, I'm sort of praying and hoping huh. that that will, that will keep happening. Well, this is, <clears throat> this brings to mind something that I think is uh, like a very nice, how would you say? the minimum viable example of a fundamental which mm. is that the the relationship between self and community right so we have this sort of 
in our mental model, we have a notion of like self and like the whole fucking society way up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. The easiest is actually you and like one other person. That's like the micro yeah. version of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but the idea that there's a really beautiful naturalness actually to say, okay, the, the relationship um, affords, right? The relationship evolves in a way that it creates a sort of slipstream for the evolutionary journey of the individual to become more fully who they are in their proper role in the larger story. Yes. And well, so as, as the individual... Right, as yeah. the individual like becomes more able to actually situate themselves in their own pocket of, of self-becoming, they become more capable of actually supporting and nurturing the relationship in its evolutionary trajectory. Right. And that that right there, that dynamic, like that's the centerpiece of this whole third story. It's like, hey guys, what would oh. happen? We could build something around that as the fundamental oh. dynamic between individual yeah. and group. Yes, 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 yes. Oh, that's a wonderful connection. Thank you for making that. That's very yeah. that's very helpful. So I'm wondering here then um, that, I mean, a, a person who, whose work should now come into more prominence is Tillich. Uh, first of all, Tillich is one of the prophets of the meaning crisis. The courage to be is one of the great um, discussions about it. Uh, and Tillich is coming back. Uh, I, his grasp of Spinoza's grasp that, right, the, the fundamental thing you need in order to be rational is to overcome my side bias and egocentrism, and that requires love. Love is the thing that does that. So reason, uh, reason ultimately depends deeply on love. So that's in the courage to be in Salter Tillich's work. But in that book, Tillich also talks about, as he does throughout his work, about the tonos, the creative and unresolvable tension between individuation and participation. Mm. And you see what happens in the the two other systems, the the bottom up market system and the top down. Uh, 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 you know, command system. That's what they typically call it. Yeah. Right. Uh, um, right. They, they both have different, they have static and resolved models. And this is the thing, this is my critique of them. Um, they, 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 they say the, I'll speak on their behalf. I'll anthropomorphize them. The tonos between individuation and participation can be resolved and finalized here. Mm where Tillich taking a religious framework says, no, no, it can never be resolved, a religious existential framework. And in fact, what faith is, right, is faith is the ability to, you know, constantly, um, you know, uh, uh, toggle uh, between the two of them in a way in which one's responsibilities to both is maintained and one's ability to afford both is also constantly growing and uh, developed. Uh. Hmm. Yes. <laughs> I get the distinct feeling if one could simply take what you just said in all of its wholeness and all of its implications and enable it to be heard and integrated, you would be, that would sort of be the end of the story. Um, so think, just to kind of like tone, like pull pieces of that out. Um, this notion, for even, even just like the simplest, hey guys, guess what? Um, it's not, this is not a story of top or bottom or bottom or top. Turns out there's a middle. <laughs> and in the middle is like where meaningfulness actually resides. And the mean, middle is more fundamental. And the middle is what actually enables the top and the bottom to be in right relationship with each other. And the absence or the amelioration or the elision of the middle is commensurate with the meaning crisis. It's just another way of describing the same process. Yes. That the, our, our rediscovery and reestablishing ourselves in that proper middle from all the different directions. So Michelle Bowens is seeing the middle through the lens of like the commons and through right. the lens of like an economic and political orientation, yeah. right? You, the middle over here through the lens of religion. Well, the religion and commons are very, you know, this, this, this yes. journey last year, very much the same right. basic story. Uh, and so this emergence of, yes, we know the thing. The thing is this thing in the middle, right? There's this third piece, which actually sits in the proper place, bringing top and bottom into relationship. And yes, the story of the 20th century was precise the tension between two systems at this level. And they couldn't possibly be resolved in this way because the thing that was needed was actually this. And so here okay. we are. Let's get this. Let's bring it into place. Okay. So two things about that. Um, uh, First of all, if the previous point was correct and, and you said yes to it, then that points out that uh, th there's a deeper issue for the third, which is to address the concern, the presupposition shared by both the top down and the bottom up that resolution and completion and finality are possible. So mm -hmm. the third has to challenge the shared presupposition. 
Secondly, the middle, it, it, the, the middle, it, 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 it's, it, it, it's center is everywhere and its circumference is nowhere, right? But what I mean is, uh, my understanding of the middle is much more like Erigina. <clears throat> the middle is the complete interpenetration at every possible level of the emanation and the emergence. Yes. Ooh, geez, dude, your vocabulary is starting to be intense. The emanation, the emergence. Every every single word of the set of, like, I almost feel like that should be an illuminated manuscript. <clears throat> Task for those who might watch this. Uh, if you feel, if you have a deep artistic proclivity and feel so called to produce that sentence in an appropriate illuminated manuscript, I would be willing to fund it and then buy it. It sounds like a thing I'd want on my wall. So thank you for saying that. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I mean, I think this is part of what Jonathan is seeing, and it's definitely what I'm seeing in Maximus and in um, Erigina, although Erigina wasn't a church father, he should have been though. Um, and obviously in the new uh, Neoplatonic interpretation of Aquinas, uh, which is gaining steam uh, day by day. Um, now, but uh, so that, but the middle, now I also wanna bring in Nishitani. The middle is, not, the, middle is the way everything, what, what he, call, he calls it, the circumessentiality of everything. Right, everything is the center of everything else on the middle, right? Uh, so this is like Whitehead. All of the universe has come to this object, uh -huh. but this object is part of how all of the universe has come to my wooden sword over there. There is this. So the middle is not. The middle is holographic and dynamically convergent. It 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 it. it um, I, I'm thinking of um, the way Maximus talks about God. God is in included in everything but not enclosed he's beyond everything but not excluded um and nicholas of Cusa, the enfoldment and the unfoldment are one um that so the middle right the, so the middle is like, like this the complete interpenetration and the middle is is it's not it's right it's it, it's it's how everything is in everything else in this profound way but also within each within and between like remember we i've been talking about the eidetic the eidos the through line yes uh, the multi so there's a through line for each and but there's also a through line for how each is in each um it, right so the middle is incredibly dynamically thick and juicy um because it's the complete interpenetration this way and the complete interpenetration this way yeah that's the ontology that i think well, I'm proposing to you that this is an ontology that would be very helpful for grounding and affording the articulation, both in words and in action, of the third way. Oh, um, hmm. Okay, can I throw something in sideways? <laughs> I, I, okay. I, I would well, welcome I'll, I'll, A little levity, and then I'll come back. So one thing that's coming up with levity is this... Uh, uh, all right, this, you, you had a noticing of a certain role that you seem to be finding yourself playing. Uh, yeah. For me, I was kind of like router, like you said, uh, vetting, but it's more like routing. It's more like yeah. this thing comes in, this is the piece, the K point is there, that kind of a process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is perfect, right? That the notion of actually bringing in, metabolizing, surfacing the aspects of that which came in that are, in fact, the part of it that, that is appropriate to bring back out and then orienting that brain back out in a certain direction. So it's sort of a, upregulation, downregulation, and relationality thing. And then I noticed the embodied process of you doing it in the sense of, oh yeah, John actually has this giant, huge network of all of these beings, many of whom aren't alive anymore, yeah. um, that he's actually, his, he can't help. He's constantly bringing them into their, his like Spinoza and Tinnick. Like, you know, how do we, like that's, I mean, sorry, brother, that's what you're up to. <laughs> okay, so <laughs> doing it. Um, okay, that was that. Okay, oh. The middle kingdom came to my mind. Oh, right. The kingdom. I was like, huh, that's really interesting. As I think about this, like, all right, where is China? And I don't, I don't mean like politically, but yes, politically, but I also mean like intellectually and spiritually. Like, we're doing a lot of good work right now, bringing together a whole bunch of different lineages. Neither you nor I, I think, are really well positioned to really, really take responsibility for the Indian and, in particular, the Chinese lineages first order right particularly the chinese right because we don't our first language isn't going to be 
in ideograms. Like we don't have our, our literate mind is not in that structure. And that's a real thing, a fundamental thing. I'm like, okay, it's interesting. Huh, the Middle Kingdom, auspicious name to play the proper role of actually saying, what does it mean to actually just take responsibility for embodying the, the, the middle as you're describing it? Whoa, that would be a powerful place to be. It is. And both geoeconomically and intellectually, there's a gap in the Silk Road. The kingdom that used to play that role it is, as a civilization was Persia. And Persia has been removed off the picture because of the, uh, because of the current theocracy. Uh, but speaking as someone who's uh, constantly learning about the Persian diaspora, um, the people who are not in allegiance to that regime definitely see themselves as that they should have that role and that Persian culture, Persian philosophy, and this is what Corbin saw, um, played a pivotal role in this. Uh, and, and, and Persia is the linchpin between the East and the West of the Silk Road. So let's tease that apart a little bit. There's some yeah. stuff there that I think we can do. Um, and, and, and it has to do with this, okay, the absence of a proper middle. Yep. And the consequence therefore of the hardening of the polarities. Very much so. I, I really wonder what world history would have been um, if Persia had, Iran, had gone down a different path than the one it's gone down. And I don't mean the Shah had stayed in power because that was that was also not the middle. That was just- The point. Yeah, joining onto the United States, right? Hey guys, uh, like we, we, this is how it happens all the time. Like pick any conflict, you know, feel free, pick any conflict. <laughs> Both sides created it, right? One, one side creates a, 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 a pressure. Part of the consequence of that pressure is it produces a selection event that has as a natural consequence, a hardening and an increasing of the thing that is the counter version of that pressure. Right. So it actually creates its opposite. The, the two forces co-create each other. That's how conflict emerges is the polar forces create each other. So, so the, the energy of the Shah, which of course has a whole history and lineage of post-war America and the influence of the West, like a whole bunch of stuff going on in the yeah. CIA and all kinds of shit, right? Yeah. Um, produced the counter reaction of a much yes. more polarized and hardened and non-middle, not wholesomeness at the level yeah. of the Ayatollahs and the revolution. Yep. And uh, those two points sit in this equilibrium where they're effectively fully complicit in a mutual conspiracy to maintain each other as non-adaptive hardened structures, where the proper thing is actually to find a new wholesomeness that allows those energies to reintegrate and say, hey, look, Persia has a, a, is part of this story. Like Persia yes. is massively crucial. And how do we actually allow, frankly, just allow, like get the fuck out of the way and allow Persia to rebirth itself, neither as uh, sort of contra Shah, contra Western fundamentalist theocracy, or as sort of, mm, how would you say, Western client state yes. uh, separating itself from its own fundamental essence. Like that's not proper. Like the proper thing is Persia is an incredibly rich completely non-reproducible, I like think the lineage and history of the evolutionary process that actually gave rise to the characteristics of Persia could not be duplicated under any possible set of circumstances. Exactly. Needs to be, right? We cannot actually achieve world without Persia. Okay, third way, mission objective. I need Persia back on the map, fully embodied as Persia in her, in her most noble form. It's so powerful when I get to talk to and interact with the Persian diaspora. Uh, and of course, my ignorance is much more than my knowledge about this. Uh, but that they are, they are the living embodiment of that legacy of the permanent possibility of the third way. Um, and and um, that there's an intuitive understanding of that. Yeah. Um, uh, that's very hard at times for me to understand, although uh, uh, I'm trying my best, but I, 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 I'm more and more attracted to this idea. I'm trying to draw these two things together, the project you've been talking about and another project, and I'm seeing them as two different aspects. I think the third way and the reconstruction of the philosophical Silk Road, they're bound together yeah. in an important way. They're bound together in an important way. Hmm, wow. 
Yeah. So, okay. It's interesting. Just think about it. Just allow that the implications of that, um, that this is obviously by definition, huh? Golly. Yeah. Okay. Powerful. We can talk, we can talk about embodiment and the necessity of embodiment. We can talk about the theoretic and how the theoretic plays a role. But if we take the notion of the embodiment as necessary, really, then the embodiment grows, right? As we yes. say, now we're not talking about the geopolitical repositioning of Persia as a whole thing, like a whole world, a whole community, a whole depth as, as embodiment, right? It's not just yes. like some guy in some place. It's like, whoosh, it's, yes. not, it's not me like learning Qigong. It's, whoosh, we have to actually truly re-embody everything all the way up. And as that process, and of course, it has to be a co-evolutionary dynamic, whereby to the degree to which we're doing it a little bit, we increase our capacity to do it more. Right? It has that kind of maybe exponential curve characteristic that looks like that. And you can start plucking them out, right? So, you know, Elon Musk pointing at Ukraine, there's probably something very specific going on there that is of that same ilk. Um, and the, the word Ukraine, its origin actually means march, like border, boundary. Uh, oh, um, uh. It's, it was never a, a place, right? It was always a series of kingdoms that were moving back and forth between Poland, Poland, Lithuania, Austria, Russia. Like it was always sort of in that place. And it means boundary. Um, hmm, interesting. Boundary places are crucial, like the marches, the marquees. They, they are. And they are. And they're analogous to the boundary places between the disciplines where you find the where you find scientific revolutions of varying scales. So the generators of paradigm shifts are found on the borders between the disciplines rather than at the heart of a particular discipline, usually. Um, so there's something analogous to the way that works within the academic world and the way it works within the distributed cognition uh, of, I don't know what to call it, the geopolitical world or something like that. Um, yeah, okay, so we can, let me just hit, hit, it, hit it a little bit more heavily, um, which is, hey, we can't currently resolve let's say just Ukraine, using yeah. the form, the institutional forms, the, the, the degree and kind of distributed cognition that we currently have available, right? It's, it's, it's heading towards Vietnam. Oh, uh, it's heading further than that. Oh, oh really? What, what do you oh, think? Yeah. Oh, yes, it's escalating rapidly. Um, the, the scope of the implications on all sides are, is increasing. And mm -hmm. as it increases, the boundary conditions of what had been limits tend to break. Um, so there's a, a, a dynamic process whereby the, even just if you run it just as a game theoretic model on the in the, in the interior. Please do, I'm interested in your <clears throat> Yeah, okay, so I'll just run this as a, as a simple. I'll actually have to whoosh, back up. So first, this kind of thing uh, has a, maybe a proper, like a Bayesian sensibility, meaning first a proliferation of hypotheses um, yeah. then, and then a process of allowing those hypotheses to gather into a proliferation of scenarios. And there's going to be many. In my, I've actually got about 300 distinct scenarios based upon a much larger set of basic hypotheses uh, with, with uh, error bars around them because of, right. of, of, of lack of information. Remind, remembering that the metaphor fog of war was invented in the context of war. So the place where lack of clarity is highest is actually in war and we're in a war. <clears throat> and we're in a war where the, where the players are all playing, and I mean everybody, right? MI6 is participating, CIA is participating, the Russian intelligence, Israeli intelligence, like all the agencies that are around the notion of fog of war, like how do we play at the level of information warfare? They're all playing. They're all participating yeah. in this war, maybe not maximum, but a very high level. So we're talking about something where if you think you understand what's going on, <clears throat> you're already making the first error. All right, so given all that, right, so we've got this massive set of scenarios. I, that's prop. that's, that's, Partly what I was trying to evoke with Vietnam. Vietnam was the war in which the term the fog of war was invented. Ah, uh, okay, I, okay. Right, right, yeah. Yeah, so, um, yeah, what I'd say is something like the, the all right, so what I was invoking about the difference was that it was never really the case that Vietnam was existential for anybody besides the Vietnamese. Yes. And so the possibility of escalation was never really going to happen. Like the worst it could ever get was about as bad as it got, which was, you know, we escalate to the point where we're bombing the shit out of things all over the place. They escalate to the point where it's, you know, really nasty for us until eventually we're like, eh, fuck it, we're out of here. And yeah, you know, yeah. we had enough, we had enough pain that we could withdraw, but there was never going to be a point where nukes were going to fly in the context of Vietnam <clears throat> because it was never existential for us. Right. This thing is existential for Russia or either already has become existential for Russia or is accelerating in that direction. 
and they have nukes. In fact, they have lots of them. They have more than anybody. Um, and that's the key. Right? So we're dealing with a situation where we're a good 50 years past Vietnam in terms of the evolution of the capacity to engage in soft power information warfare. And right? so it hasn't been sitting still. It's been increasing in yes, intensity yes. and sophistication. Yeah. Okay. And a the primary agent or one of the two primary agents in the story is a nuclear power. And we've moved to a place where we may have already moved into a point of existential consequences, meaning, okay, so game theoretically, uh, let's see. One, one piece, one hypothesis is looking at the binding between literally specifically the individual person, Putin, and the choice making of Russia as a whole system. Yes. Right? Yes, one, yes. one inquiry is how strong is that binding? And by the way, is it getting stronger or weaker or more fragile or more resilient under the pressures of the current selection environment? Right? Because right. we know right. these things right. tend to break. They tend to be bifurcation events. Right? As, as, as stakes get raised, as the energy in the system goes up, structures either become more fragile and shatter, uh, say Muammar Gaddafi, uh, yeah. or they actually get stronger. And, and, and actually become more and more intense, like we talked about with Iran and the Republic. Yep, yep. There was a process where the counter pressure of, of the Shah created its alternative that had enough strength to eventually break out. Right? That's the, the evolutionary dynamic. All right? So one question is that. So one directionality is the energy breaks and essentially this is regime change, right? This is, this is yep. Putin is removed and Russia now doesn't have Putin. Now the consequences of that regime change in, in the current context uh, is very wide open. Like let's just say chaos is sort of the place where that ends up. The possibility of having a enough energy in the system whereby, I mean, just think about the, the implications of what it would mean to remove Putin and his entire top-down control structure and all the different individuals and, and, and deals and elements that were actually brought into being over the past 30 years in the context of Russia and the psychology, history, and, and intrinsic characteristics of Russia. If you remove right. that, you're going to have a vacuum, and that vacuum is happening in a in a China India US tension, right? So there's going to be this whoosh, movement into that vacuum, which is extremely high, and by the way, is probably better than the alternative. Right? So the alternative is there's a binding in the interior that's strong enough that essentially Putin's choice making is the same as Russia's choice making. All right. So he now is in a context where it's his interests, his existential interests, not to allow that fracturing to occur. So right. first and foremost, he has to maintain so that Russia, his fate and Russia's fate are the same. So his game theoretic structure, and it seems there's very high degree of like my confidence interval that he's neither incompetent nor insane is pretty high now. Like I've been getting more and more information that he is still rational and not addled. And so he's functioning at some level of where he has been functioning for the past 30 years. So we can use that as a rough model. So as a chess player, as a game theoretic player, um, Okay, that's going to be very clear, right? His fortunes are first and foremost require that he stays firmly in charge of the directionality of Russia, which means that it's in his interests to continue to implicate Russia's fortunes in his first his future. So to escalate things so that uh, one, his position is not weakened, but even better, his position is strengthened. Like, how does he actually continue to make things so that the counter pressure is something that is perceived as a um, popular and by the way, the middle zone, like the only people who could yeah. potentially participate in regime change, like in the military or in the yeah. state interior are, are find themselves caught in a story where they are pulled into the same zone where him being at the, uh, at the top or him making choices is shared. And so um, losing in Ukraine is almost certainly a non-story for that, for that game theory. And right? so what does right, it look right. like to to win, there's only two paths. One path is a path of escalation. The more likely that they're losing the kinetic war, which does seem to be the dominant possibility, not the exclusive, but the dominant possibility, the more necessary it is that they continue to escalate um, because they have to have something like a colorable win, or by they, I mean Putin in particular. Um, and then the other side, by virtue of the magnitude of the response from the West, both in terms of economic, Right, the, the, the complete dislocation, at least in principle. It's not clear to me how much of that is virtue signaling and how much of that is fact actually happening. But for example, SWIFT happened. Um, the magnitude of that response, the implications and the consequences for Russia um, raised the ante tremendously. Like there's, there's kind of like, we may already, Russia may already be dead. Like the Putin era Russia, the post-Soviet Russia may already have died. 
right? We're now actually in the birth of something new because kind of like no matter what, like they're fucked, like their economy is crushed in, in many, many different levels. And it's um, being disclosed that their military is not very good. Right. And has been purposefully maintained hobbled by their own state apparatus, yeah. right? So it's a, right? Leaderships are very bad for militaries generally. This is not well understood by people. Yes. This is one of the reasons why the Israelis could, could one among many reasons of why they continue to beat the Arab states because dictatorships uh, always have redundancies and competing member and they don't let yep. any one person become powerful yep. and they don't want brilliant people in charge etc cetera, etc cetera. right they have to they have to maintain everything below them has to be held at the minimum viable external capacity yes. and uh, not crossing any threshold of internal threat and that that creates a certain dynamic um so the the question is something like uh so the West seems to be making choices that are, are escalating in a very interesting way, meaning John Robb has put together a, a hypothesis that is essentially a, this, wow, it's interesting, J Jonathan Paggio's Ed Angel, yeah, yeah. shift that to Egregore or shift yeah, yeah. to network. Yeah. Right, so right. something that doesn't have consciousness, the network, right, a network collective or distributed cognition that is, is driven by... Um, a lack of capacity, like for example, I, I said something to one of John Robb's tweets. I said, look, the network doesn't have a sense of mortality. Yes. The, the network isn't a living being that is aware of the fact that death exists. It's a whole series of feedback loops that produce results, but they are operating in a entirely algorithmic, you know, in, like a tornado or a hurricane, yes. it's operating yes, yes. as a natural phenomenon. And the network right now seems to be driving the choice making of the West in a directionality of escalation. Yes. Uh, with a much, much less level of carefulness and rationality grounded in love, as you said earlier, than we've had in the past. Right. Pushing the context of the game theoretic landscape in the con of Russia, Putin specifically, to a place where it has become increasingly existential for Putin, which then also means increasingly existential for Russia right. to a greater or lesser extent. Like the path of what does it look like to do something which is not that is existential for Putin, but not existential for Russia. And is there any path right now that's not existential for Putin? Right? That's, that's maybe a primary question, if you just simplify. Is there any path right now that's not existential for, for Putin? And is there any path where there's something that is existential for Putin, but he doesn't have the capacity in himself to produce a result where it's also existential for Russia? Right? That kind of dynamic. And by the way, are we already on the other side of that threshold? So the, the magnitude of the, of, the, of the end state consequences is that if there's something that's just truly existential for a fully functional nuclear power, that's a whole new landscape, right? It ain't anything we've ever experienced. Um, we may already be in the middle of that. And so therefore, uh, and by hypothesis, the network is creating trouble. Like we have this giant capacitant, hyper-agentic, yeah. form of distributed cognition, which has no consciousness and has no morality, right? It's just sort of driven as a pure, hyper-powerful mob. Let's say a yeah. demon, not an angel, just to make the egregore metaphor work nicely. The, the sort of the bloodlust demon, the egregore of war itself, which has lots of different names in different cultures. And the existing institutional structures seem to be in, unable, and I would say it's probably quite likely they're in fact structurally unable to hold things together in the context of the building complexity and the emergence dynamics that are happening. All of this is a very long way of getting back to the point that was the bridge, which is uh, this third path is increasingly showing up as being now obligate. Right? We've talked about it in the past. It's like if we want to get through the hyper objects of the problems, details we're yeah. dealing with, well, here's one right in front of us that's getting hotter and hotter and has a lot of like nice, simple, super salient. Uh, yeah, yeah. This uh, is, urgency. Yes. yeah. And so you're, 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 you're one thing you're saying, you're saying many things and there is a complex weave. But one thing you're saying is Ukraine and Russia is an example that we cannot generate the relevant distributed cognition for solving these kinds of problems. It, it does not have the structural syntax, the generative syntax uh, for generating the right kind of collective intelligence for dealing with the complexity of this. So it's yeah. bound, it's bound to fail is what I, in fact, I hear you saying. Yeah, that would be the implication. Right, you've got a, a very complex, high-stakes problem, and the, the the generative syntax to produce 
a, 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 a navigation is essentially random, right? It's not bound to fail, but the, yeah. the trajectory is not stewarded in a fashion which is, is, has any probability of going to a positive direction. It's going to be, right. you know, stochastic more or less. Right, 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 right. Uh, well, what I meant was the the the, 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 all the parties involved won't solve the problem in some way that a recognizable human goal has been achieved. Instead, it will, however this is going to turn out, it's going to dissolve rather than resolve. Yes. That's, yes. What I, that's what I hear you saying. Yeah. And we can say, by the way, if we want to invoke the notion of egregore, that the Moloch dynamic is very, very powerful here. Right? The, the degree yes. to which that kind of characteristic, when you don't have something that can actually hold the whole system in its interior, then you've got a multipolar trap. And in a multipolar trap, we know that the dynamics actually tend to be downward spirals. And so it actually would be the thing that if we don't have a distributed cognition yeah. that can actually hold the whole hyper object of the problem, then the most likely next step is downward spirals. So we, we, we should then see reciprocal narrowing until we get a behavior that looks addictive in nature. Yes. But there's no other option. There's no other way for us to be uh, kind of well, thing. We, we can actually do a, a retro. Let's take a look back for the past several weeks. Yeah. Kind of what it's been looking like. Yeah. Like yeah. lots of choices are being made from a play. Even even like the actual words are we have no choice but. What yeah. else could we do but? And then yeah. the but leads us to a choice, which actually is an escalation, which increases the intensity and decreases the degrees of freedom across the entire field. Yes. I, I think this is a, is a good argument you're making. Um, so shifting it back to the bigger, the, the larger conversation we were having, yeah. right? Ukraine, Ukraine. <laughs> I, I don't want to sound overly simplistic because a lot of people are dying and suffering, and I, right. I want to I'll acknowledge that. But Ukraine should become Persia or or something like a Persia, right? Um, and and right, um, or maybe and then help Persia to become Persia again, right? or something like that. Right. that. We need we need places that. Yeah, that are organized differently from both the West and the uh, and the East, whatever those point to. Uh, yeah, well, um, it's interesting if you just sort of say it that way, that simply. Say, well, okay, there's a lot of places that sort of already self-identify, and we had the phrase "the third world" in the past. In yeah. that or in that story, it was Russia and the U.S., but in the current story, it's it's China, right, and yeah. the West, which is of course yeah. mostly U.S. dominated. And like, okay, if I were to go to a, the, around the world and say, yeah, which of you really feel like you properly belong in one of those two spheres? You're going to get a whole bunch of people saying, not me, you know? <laughs> it's really like, well, I'm not part of the, either of those two. Russia is like, like, look, I'm neither Chinese nor American. Like, we're neither, there's a whole giant chunk of the human population. It's like, no, we're uh, super not into being either dominated by either of these two. Is there something, some third path where we're actually able to be who we are, like really actually be us, without being dominated by somebody else. That would be kind of neat. That'd be a kind of a nice invitation. Um, like what's the proper relationship between Ukraine and Persia? Well, in some sense, not, right? Neither, neither one is, is really at, at all proper to sort of govern or dominate the other. The only proper relationship is to support each other and simply being who they are and allowing right. them to have the interior capacity to not be dominated by somebody else. Uh, the Hanseatic League is, the, is the, the historical example that I have uh, as a, what this kind of thing has looked like in the past. Yes, the, the the leagues. The problem with the leagues, of course, as soon as you said the Hanseatic League, I thought of the Delian League, and I thought of how 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 able Athens was to turn the league into its own personal empire. Right? Very and, tricky. And, and, yeah. 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 League Very design. Good. League design is a is we're going to have to get that figured out. But that's kind of like okay, so this becomes in some sense the proper geopolitical, and we, we've been in the context of say Web three. Yeah. The third path has begun the process of thinking about things like governance and economy and finance on its own basis. All right, fine. Now we're going to have to start thinking about what does geopolitics look like on its own basis. I and like the term league design. League I design. Think that, I yeah. thought that was very cool. Um, league design. That's very interesting. Um, so Elon, that's actually the, the, the right next move is we have to actually step back a little bit. And before you engage in single combat with Vladimir, we actually need to think about how do we actually put together the right kind of constructs that have the generative capacity to actually produce league design. So we actually have an envelope that can hold Ukraine. By the way, it could actually be a very simple first move, which is 
we're just going to move Ukraine as the new kingdom of Ukraine under Elon Musk as king, given, <laughs> given the Ukrainians, by the way, universally saying yes, like, okay, if that's the thing that stops the war right now that doesn't create more havoc. I can imagine that. I can imagine the Ukrainians saying, fair enough. Elon goes, all right, I'm going to move SpaceX and Tesla to the Ukraine. So you're now going to become like a much more generative place than you've been in the past. Peace immediately. <laughs> you know, I'm obviously waving my hands vigorous a bit. <laughs> uh, we need to generate a generator function that produces as its output has the capacity to produce lead design, which has the necessary and sufficient and compact characteristics to generate the geopolitical architecture of the third path. You know, that's, that's where we are once again. Um, but I would say by the way, with a certain optimism, we articulated something very similar in one of our first conversations around religion and, yes. and that's moving forward. Like we're making a lot of progress. Yeah, the religion is not a religion. Yes, very much. Um, and unpacking, as we did in this conversation, the ontology of the middle. Um, yes, and deeply connected. I mean, just think about, like, what are the implications? Like, well, okay, well, Persia is probably going to have something along the lines of its own sort of variation, microcosm of the religion is not a religion. It's going to yes. have a religion or some, some set of religions. And Ukraine is going to have a religion or some set of religions. And they actually need to be in an ecumenical relationship internally that has a higher, you know, the, the middle path actually allows them to be deeper and richer and more intense simultaneously. And then for them to be part of anything vaguely like a league, those have to actually be able to be in proper relationship. Yeah, the, the, court, the courtyard, they have to have yeah. the courtyard in order for, for them to talk in a way that makes a league that's neither yeah. an empire uh, nor just an, uh, an aggregate of, uh, of nation states. Yes. I, wonder if, I wonder if China could see fit to actually shift Tibet into this kind of a role fundamentally because it's played that role historically yes a, it has it was role. it was it was an integral part of one branch of the silk road and it was clearly that uh that philosophically culturally yeah, yeah the way it mediated uh, uh between india and china um and it, it and feels also, to me if i if i tune into the signal of the mandate of heaven yeah that it is in fact out of alignment, it is improper, uh, like for the Middle Kingdom to have a relationship with Tibet in the fashion that it is, yes. is actually out of alignment and therefore deeply disruptive to the integrity of the Middle Kingdom itself, like to the degree to which it actually achieves a proper consciousness and reawakens its uh, its sort of internal capacity to perceive itself well. It would well, actually naturally notice that it needs to move Tibet into a very different space than it has been. Well, China is China right now is embodying. Uh, what do I want to say? I want the, the placeholder of the hybrid without the realization of it. Yes. Because it's officially communist, but it's economically capitalist. It's top down, but it's also anarchic up, and it's like it's doing all this. And right, it, it, it it's 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 an incoherent, incoherent society right now. But not right. the kind of right. It's the incoherence that it that is not being allowed. Uh, what do I want to say to create it to complexify it just keeps being sort of antagonistic uh, without saying oh and out of this here's the new that's beyond both instead yeah. it's just like uh, right um, yeah I mean this is for the move it's, it's actually almost exactly right the move for Xi to move from being premier for life as an exponent of a fundamentally western architecture the CCP to actually yeah. becoming emperor Xi yeah. Um, with the mandate of heaven behind him is this move, right? The actual, hey, how do you move up? How do you actually truly rediscover the essence of China and its you know, Taoism and its Confucianism and all that stuff that's distinctly not Western and establish that as actually being the basis by which it embodies itself and you know, perhaps continues to integrate aspects of what has happened to it over the past century, but from a very different perspective. Like that's, yeah. I think, a piece of this story is that actually that move. And as you say, that's, I think, the only way for it to actually achieve a stability itself. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The trouble is China seems to be squashing. Well, sorry, not China. The Communist Party seems to be squashing any attempts at creating new religious frameworks for allowing this transformation to occur. It's so scared of, like, you know, the way that they treated Falun Gong, right? Yeah. And other, th other things that are trying to emerge to, to do the religious synthesis, right? It keeps squashing those. Because yeah, yeah. I think this is very simple, though. Like, if the clarity of it is something like this is because the Chinese, the Communist Party, is a complete anomaly and makes no sense as a governance yeah. mechanism. Yes. So the real thing it's truly fearing 
is the reality of its inappropriateness. I agree with that. I agree with that. That's, it's, it's actually at the bottom is actually just the fact that it should not be the proper thing. I hate to say it, but it's just what it is. China needs an emperor. Yes. Um, for, until further notice, China needs an emperor. And the CCP is an archaism of a Western bureaucracy that is has examples, right? China has gone through periods of warring state periods with warlords and that kind of thing. And that's kind of what the CCP is evolving towards. And you know, as, a, as an attractor in the space of China, that's always associated with chaos, not with order, right? Yeah. So if China wants to continue to progress in the direction of chaos, it will continue to allow the fear at the heart of the essence of the CCP to drive its choice making. If it wants to evolve towards order, it will tr recognize and transcend beyond that and settle into a new imperial mode, which is first and foremost is going to have to be reconnecting with and governing its essence, its sort of Chinese essence, and, and actually stepping way outside of the architectures of the West. Yes. Um, whew, well, that's a big one. Like, I don't, that's way beyond my capacity to do a whole lot more than just say, man, yeah, probably so. And I, like, I think something similar about the fact that the regime, the theocracy in Iran is becoming progressively disconnected from the deep history of Persia. In, in, in a very, very powerful way. Um, yeah, yeah, I think, I think it's one of those things where you can actually say, <laughs> again, if we sort of just go, let's go from the middle. Yeah. Uh, how's it go? It's so funny, actually, the way the mind works. Simple, people tend to always find themselves, or all too often, there you go, I actually said it. They find themselves all too often falling into the trap of polarization. Yeah, yeah. So. I can say something like, what's happening in Ukraine is horrendous. And I can also say, the US's bombing of just Libya thus far was actually more horrendous in terms of human life. Just FYI, like that's something that doesn't even show up on the historical record. Like in American consciousness, like what are shitty things Americans have done? We're like, how about the bombing of Libya? And you're not gonna find like almost any Americans gonna say, yeah, that was rough. Well, if you actually go back and look at it, the bombing of Libya around the Arab Spring, like that actually killed more civilians than I understand have been killed in Ukraine so far by a pretty large margin, actually, a lot. Wow, I, mean, I didn't honestly. know that. Yeah. yeah. So now this doesn't mean, by the way, that Ukraine isn't shitty, right? It just means, hey, we're really like, there's all kinds of shittiness going on. And the proper answer is to say, how can we stop being shitty? Like that's yeah. the proper answer. And by we, I mean all of us. Like how do we yeah. all collectively find a way to stop being shitty? Not how do I use the fact of your being shitty to justify my being shitty? Or use the fact of you using the fact of my being shitty to justify you, like that polarization thing. No, what's the middle? Right? And this middle in the way you're describing it, not this sort of weird artificial middle, which is trying to be like a, uh, a median of two points. Not that, like that's not a real thing, but this lived thing in the, in the actual uh, life, the meaningfulness piece. And to say, okay, yeah, yeah, Persia, we get it. West, we fuck shit up bad. Like a, a, a really bad combination of super sociopathic manipulation that was utterly uh, greedy and um, uh, unhuman and just complete reckless, recklessness, right? You know, yeah, yeah. Flooding, flooding Persia with the implications of contemporary 1950s capitalism and media infrastructure yes. created disruptions in the field of that, yes. of that culture that were just unconscionably reckless. So we had a combination yes. of like just straightforward malevolent smart people manipulating things for their own narrow benefit and we had maybe even well-intentioned recklessness and yeah. fuck shit up in a very bad way and yeah. okay so we're going to try to figure out how to not do that anymore like we're going to we're going to try to figure out how to take responsibility for ourselves and start stepping back what does that actually look like for us to do that one of it is this third way it's like hey yeah. i can't personally right now take any responsibility for the west you know i can say, tell you this i feel zero percent zero point zero zero percent percent, uh, percent uh, of either, um, how would I say, ability to steer the governance of any of the Western powers or mm -hmm. sense of being represented by any of the governance of any of the Western powers. Right, 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 right. right. I, I watch it. In, in principle, titularly, I get the opportunity to have a vote and maybe write some stuff in social media. My sense of it is that it grounds to exactly zero. Okay. All right. Looks like I'm, I'm basically signing up for powerlessness or the third path. Like that's basically where I am, right? I can either, <laughs> like, oh, well, fuck it. I guess this is what's going to happen. I hope things work out. Probably won't. Or something new, some new path. Right? My guess is a very large fraction of the entire world feels that way. Hey, yes, yes. You know, 
the yes. governance, like, you know, the classic story of the Russians in the Soviet Union, where like, you know, 98% turn out on every election. They all happen to vote for the, you know, the premier of the Communist Party. Right. Um, why was I saying that? Oh, well, that's part of the story. It's like, I can actually now, I'm obligated. I can't help but say, hey, I didn't fuck up Persia as an individual. Like, I mean, yeah. I have no particular responsibility for that. And I'm already stepping up saying I can't even feel connected agentically to any of any of that infrastructure. So I'm actually able to step out and say, okay, fine. I, there's problems going on here that I want to deal with for my own personal well-being, like just in terms of my family and like the places that I live. So we're all kind of aligned now. There's a whole thing. There's escalation in Ukraine leading to nuclear war, but it's also just the sheer entropy of comprehensive bad news governance, which has this polar dynamic, which pulls things so that people are not actually participating in anything that could actually produce generative wholesomeness. Yeah. And I'm stepping up and saying, yep, one of the ways that I'm going to spiritually be able to not feel like a uh, connected to either the incentive structures or the legacy uh, karma of, for example, just as an example, the West participation, the Anglo-American West mostly participation in what happened to Persia that gave rise to the Republic. I'm basically yeah. doing the Hawaiian ho'a po'apono. I say, hey, I'm personally willing to step right now into taking full responsibility for the future. and essentially metabolizing where I can and where it actually is appropriate for me to take responsibility for what has happened in the past. And I'm entering into that space of agreement with anybody else who's willing to step into that with me. And here's what we're going to work on. Like that's maybe in the beginning of the third path is that. Right, right. Yes, I agree. I think that was very well said. Huh. So by the way, indigenous folks and the Hawaiians in particular, like that, that word, that ho'oponopono, yeah. That notion of what they call that's a uh, a lineage healing psychotechnology. Right. When you enter into it, one of the things you notice is it's you're entering into it in, into a complex environment. So if you and I have got a problem, we know that we our problem may actually be much bigger than us because right? we're both yes. part of the whole world. So we're saying, hey, first we're noticing we got a problem. So we're stepping into the into the arena of healing our relationship, and noticing that in the arena of healing our relationship, it's an implication of all of our relationships. Uh, so right. there could be a lot more going on. And we're recognizing that we may not have the capacity or the proper responsibility for all that other shit. But to the degree to which we do, we're you know, kind of put it kneeling in the center and saying, we're you know, entering into a sacred space of healing for this. And we're going to do everything we can to sort of step all the way out for all of it and invoke as much of it as we can and whatever that looks like. So that's maybe a really interesting role to begin the process of the invitation of some of the indigenous characters in this story. Like that third path, there is actually a fourth out there. I mean, you've got the West, you've got the East, you've got all the other civilizations that aren't West or East, and then you've got the entire indigenous platform, which is sort yeah. of like, hey, by the way, all of humanity, every human is human, and there's all these indigenous cultures that are not civilizations in the way that I and I think Tyson yeah. and have described it, that are operating at a very different frequency, and they have a role to play in this as well, fundamentally. Very yes. important. Yes. Jeez. All right. We better stop. We can keep going, but I'm noticing like I'm super tired. <laughs> yeah, I'm getting tired too. Uh, and I have to go for another meeting. Uh, oh. Now you've got a lot of, I love how much uh, some combination of either energy, self-care practice, or just commitment, but it's, uh, it's beautiful to see. Well, thank you for that. Uh, thank you for this conversation. It was gen it uh, generally took genuinely took on uh, a real life of its own. And I, I really enjoyed the discussion. Thank you very much. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. All right. Well, I am looking forward to meeting you in person sometime soon. It looks oh. like late June in Austin might be one example. Right. Uh, and possibly, as I've mentioned, uh, maybe earlier in, uh, in your neck of the woods in the, the great, That'd north, be really wonderful. great north. That'd be really, really wonderful. All right, brother. Take good care. Yeah.